Welcome to City Church. We are a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus, grow together, and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. For those of you who've been with us, you know that we've been spending an entire year in the kingdom of God. What is it and how do you live in it? And so with that, um, the key reality of the kingdom of God, according to Jesus, is this prayer he taught us to pray. And so I'm gonna ask that we would pray it out loud together. It's called the Lord's Prayer. It's found in Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Let's pray together. This then is how you should pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth in Charlottesville as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from the evil one. You may be seated. So the sermon that I'm going to bring this morning is going to be taken from Philippians chapter four, verses six through nine, four verses. Now, in the midst of that, though, I'm going to kind of share with you, we're gonna take a deep dive into the scripture as far as what Paul is saying. We're gonna take a look at some of the technical terms that he uses in writing his letter to the church of Philippi. By the way, the reason why we chose the book of Philippians, pretty simple, is that it's the one pastoral epistle, the one pastoral letter that Paul writes that doesn't begin with rebuke, have rebuke in the middle and rebuke at the end. (laughs) Paul was a very bold pastoral presence. Not that we're avoiding rebuke, rebuke's a key part of life. But the reason why we're focusing on the book of Philippians is if we're going to know what the kingdom is and live in it well, why not look at the church that got it right? So the apostle Paul writes this letter to the church at Philippi and says, you're doing it right, keep doing what you're doing. And then he gives some pastoral advice. And so what I'm going to do in this message, we're gonna take a deep dive into these verses. We're gonna look at them very deeply. And we're gonna look at the technical side of things. And then I'm gonna have a huge, unusual amount of kind of pastoral observation because what we're going to take a look at is the peace of God, the peace of God. Let's read Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Do not be anxious about anything. How you doing? (laughs) We're a total of about six words in, and some of us have already lost our shalom. It's gone. (laughs) Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and... If you will do that, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, in other words, all of us, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Where has your mind been? Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. What is peace? What is peace? Well, biblically, peace is actually the Hebrew word shalom. In in Greek, it's arene. That's the Newer Testament word. Arene and shalom, same thing. But peace or shalom is the idea of completeness or wholeness. It's not the lack of war. It isn't. Although that can be part of it. But there's an understanding in the mind of the Apostle Paul and in the mind of Jesus that peace is not something that's based on external circumstances. Peace is something that you can have in the midst of incredible chaos. It's shalom. I was born in 1964. And I remember in the early 70s, there was what was called the peace sign. Here's the peace sign. 
Now, for those of you who were born later, I've got an emoji for you just so you can follow along. Here's the emoji. (laughs) But when I was a kid, I remember so well, there was a cry for peace. It's not wrong. But the idea was is that there would be peace and not war. That was the cry. Nothing wrong with that. But you realize on American soil, we have lived perpetually without war since our founding. We are the most mechanized, educated nation that's ever been on God's green earth. And yet anxiety is at an all-time level. We have every reason not to be anxious, but we are. When you think about a biblical perspective on shalom, It's the idea of wholeness, completeness. It's the idea of multiple parts coming together in alignment and working together. Biblically speaking, in the Older Testament, when you look at shalom, you learn some very interesting things. The noun shalom or peace can also be used as a verb. That's common in Hebrew. Shalom as a verb is when King Solomon brings shalom when he completes the temple. The temple wasn't complete. And when he completed the temple, it said he brought shalom. He was shaloming Israel by completing the temple. This is real fascinating. The book of Proverbs says to heal a broken relationship is to bring shalom. Do you have a broken relationship? In the Older Testament, shalom is when rival kings not only cease to battle each other, but join together for the the common good of all people in both nations. In other words, shalom just goes beyond a peace treaty and a lack of war. Shalom is actually demonstrated when nations come together and work for the common good. What's amazing, though, is in Israel's history, You have to look a long way to find a king that ever did that. And so the prophets of old looked into the future for a king that would accomplish this. And in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, we read a verse that's common at Christmas. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Shalom. He will usher in the kingdom and he will bring God shalom. And then Jesus says this, John 14, 27, shalom, irene, I leave with you. My shalom, my irene, I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Another way to translate that is, the world cannot give you shalom. It can't. It doesn't have it to give. And so, when we look at the text, I'd like us to look at what we just read and let's learn from the church of Philippi that was doing this well. What did Paul say to them? What pastoral advice did he give? We're gonna look at Paul's pastoral direction or thoughts and then I'm gonna share a bunch of mine. Paul writes this in verse six. Don't be anxious about anything. How are you doing with peace? and anxiety. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. I want you to do something, and I'm doing this in every service, and I I trust you'll do this with us online. I know it's phenomenally corny. I know this but I want you to do something. Place your hand over your heart and now put your hand on your head. And I want you to rub in opposite directions. No, I'm just kidding. I want you to think about, just hold on there, just kind of mess up your hairdo, hold it there. I want you to think about about what, what Paul just said. He said, if you will do this, what he just said, and we're gonna get back to that, he said, God will guard the distance between your head and your heart. And that's where chaos enters. When your heart and your head are on different frequencies. And Paul says that in Christ, 
God in Christ has an ability to have a sentinel, a guard that will cover that 18 inches. Now I know your arms are getting exhausted, so put them down. But listen, the reality of it is, is there's a battle for our minds and our hearts. And the battle is, is to get them separated so that there's dysfunction and dissidence and chaos between the two. Again, I said I was going to be pastoral and I'm going to be honest about my own life when it comes to anxiety and that distance between head and heart. I don't know how you are, but there are times in my life, and this can last for about four or five mornings in a, in a row right when I wake up and then it can go away for months. But I have this experience where I will get up in the morning and literally as my mind wraps around awakeness, there's this feeling of anxiousness or anxiety. And what I'll do is, or what I used to do was I'd go, okay, why do I feel anxious? And then I do the mental math. And the first thing I'll always say to myself is, what did I just dream about? Do you know, I don't remember my dreams at all. How many of you remember dreams frequently? How many are like me? You can't remember the last dream, right? Okay, so I'll get up and I'll go, what was I dreaming about? And I'm kind of clawing up into just being awake. And there's anxiety that's there. C.S. Lewis, in his books, teaches there's a spiritual force behind that. Spiritual force that's trying to get you sideways at the beginning of your day. Because many times I've sat there to do the mental math and I can't figure it out. Why am I anxious? So in the book Screw Tapes Letters, C.S. Lewis says, the adversary comes to get you off kilter first thing. So here's what I've done. I started doing this years ago and it works and I just want to challenge you. And it's this, when I wake up, and there's that anxious presence that's waiting. And you may go, that's not spiritual. Take your pick, but the solution will be the same. What I do is, is I'm waking up, and I feel that. Here's what I do. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive me of my debts as I forgive those who are indebted to me. And lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from the... I think Jesus intends us to pray that prayer. I honestly do. And so if you struggle like I do at times, I want to encourage you to do that. Just wake up and say the Lord's Prayer. Because again, what is trying to do, and whether it's just culture whether there's a spiritual force behind it, which I believe that there is, what that reality is trying to do is get chaos and dysfunction and distance between heart and head. That 18-inch highway. Now, let me be clear. There's truly medical anxiety. There can be physicality realities. There can be metaphor. I know this. And look, for those, you take medication, you do what you're supposed to do. But I think for many of us, God, in the book of Philippians, chapter four, verses six through nine, is revealing some truths to us, and we just don't employ them. We don't. But here's what Paul says. Paul says that if we will make our requests to God when we get anxious, we bring that stuff in prayer, that he will guard your hearts and your minds. The Greek word heart is the Greek word cardia. It's where we get the English word cardio from. And it involves the heart, the mind, character, inner self, will, intention, and center. You know, it's fascinating to note as I was doing a word study on this text that the word heart is used over 800 times in the Bible and it never once refers to that organ that pumps blood. Never. Every time. It's about the soulishness, the center of life. And what Paul says is, look, when you have anxiety, if you're willing to bring it to God in prayer, that distance between mind and heart, that God is going to positional a, he's going to position a sentinel or a guard to protect that highway. It's interesting to note that the Greek word for guard, there's several of them, but this one's really fascinating. 
It's the idea that there's a guard position to keep watch. But not only is that guard defensive, but that guard is also offensive. Isn't that fascinating? The word that Paul uses means that God will not only guard, but go on the offense to protect you. Now, this sermon is going to be highly practical. And there's a lot of pastoral thoughts here, so we're getting feet to your faith early in this message. Now, what's interesting to note is that Paul in that text says that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your minds and your hearts. Here's what I come to believe. If you try to do the mental math on God's peace, it's not going to work because it goes beyond human thinking. It's not something that you can get a hold of intellectually. It's something that happens because God invests God's self in the midst of your life when you bring your anxieties to God. It's almost like when God looks at, the Apostle Paul and God looks at marriage and says, it's a mystery. How many of you are like, amen to that? Marriage is a mystery. And you read books on marriage, which you ought to. And if you're getting married, get premarital. Get premarital counseling before you get engaged. There's too much investment once you're engaged. Do it before you get engaged. Why? You need to learn about each other. But Paul looks at marriage and goes, that thing's a mystery. And those of us who are living it go, amen. It's a mystery. I don't get how it all works either. Look at your spouse and say, you're a mystery to me. Just kidding. But it's the same way with this. Paul says, look, the peace of God, the shalom of God is something that we can step into in prayer, but how it actually works, it transcends understanding. If you do the mental math on it, you won't come to the end of the equation because it's a God thing. It's a God thing. But Paul is careful to say a couple of things. He goes on to say, By the way, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble and right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Then he goes on to say, think about the good stuff of God. And if you think about such things, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The peace of God... The God of peace. And Paul says two things that fascinates me. He says, think and then put into practice. Think and put into practice. Think in Greek is logizomai, which means logic. It means logical. So for Paul in the spirit realm, this is logical. It's logical to do this. To think about the God stuff, stuff that's praiseworthy. I don't know if you've noticed, but there's very little praiseworthy stuff that comes at you through the news. Not that you shouldn't be informed, but I have a dear friend of mine that I watched do a downhill slide for about three years, and I finally said something. I said, you know what? You're living in a constant state of negativity. I said, what do you think you can do about that? And then they mentioned some news outlet and said, I think I need to unplug. I said, amen. Think about what's praiseworthy. Not only that, the Apostle Paul says, think and then practice this. The Greek word for practice means that it's going to be a regular practice. There's going to be a routine or a habit that you build into your life. Now, let me get very pastoral And God has just given me the strength and blessed me for the past 35 years I've pastored full time. And here are some things that I have noticed. If you were raised in a home that was dysfunctional and chaotic and often filled with crisis, I want you to just think something through. This is what I've observed. That if you were raised in a home like that, your flesh is going to be drawing your spirit towards what's common to you, what's comfortable to you. And it may sound bizarre, but for a lot of people that were raised in chaos, chaos is where they're comfortable. And so when God shows up with shalom, it's very uncomfortable to live there. 
And people that have been raised in dysfunction or chaos often move towards that because that's native ground. Do you follow this? And I will tell you again, I want to say it again, it gets very uncomfortable to live in peace in shalom. And it feels odd at first. It takes a while to get your stability. And why do I say this? I've watched for years people have come to faith in Jesus, true conversion, deep conversion, deep salvation, and God's reworking them, transforming them. Metamorphosis is what it's called. It's the inside-out transformation, and things are going well, and then all of a sudden, here's how I frame it, they pull the the, the pin out of the grenade and drop it right at their feet and blow themselves up. You ask yourself, why? Why did you, you just blew it up? Why? And it's because, you know what their native territory is? It's, it's dysfunction and chaos. That's what they're used to. And the flesh is trying to get back to that stability and equilibrium. So notice that Paul's having to call people out of a chaotic culture and say, look, here's the peace of God. It's a mystery. It's available to you. Come on in. Take a step towards it. It's interesting to note again that the word for practice means routine or habit. The reality of it is this is something we step into every day. Jesus admitted that. Listen to the text, Matthew 6, 34. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Days are filled with trouble. Jesus admitted that. The other few things that I have noticed that pastorally I wanted to talk about is um, I want to talk to college students briefly. I think it's important. And that is that when college students go off to college, and I've served with college students now for three and a half decades, when college students go off to college, they sit in their dorm room and they talk about their parents. Parents, if you think they're not talking about you, you're out of your mind. They are. It's universal. So college students get together and they start talking about their parents. One of two things tends to happen, and I've noticed this for decades. One of two things happens is some students will come out of those conversations and be so grateful for the parents that they have. Just unbelievably grateful. When you went off to college, you thought your parents were the worst. And then you sat in a dorm room and you started talking. You're like, wow, mom and dad aren't half bad, you know? And you begin to get a little bit grateful. And it's not uncommon in my own where my kids would shoot you this random text, just so thankful for whatever. Believe me, I was not the perfect dad. Just ask my kids. But the other thing that can happen is that you sit and you begin to talk. And instead of focusing on things that are praiseworthy, and I'm not talking about ignoring what needs to be worked on, but you can begin to live in the negative realm. And I've watched college students do that, where a distance and a bitterness and a rage begins to grow towards parents. I've seen it for years. And so what the gospel calls us to, what Jesus calls us to, is to live in God's best and God's shalom. And for those of you who are college students, I want you to think about something that's been very impactful in my own life. You see, the Ten Commandments, conservative Jewish rabbis teach us that the Ten Commandments are actually what's called a chiasmus. In other words, the Ten Commandments fold over on themselves, and law number one goes with law number six. Law number two goes with law number seven. Law number three goes with law number eight. And when you look at that, what you'll find is when it lays over as a chiasmus, the Ten Commandments, what you'll find is law number five, honor your father and your mother and do not covet, come together. And here's what the rabbis teach. The rabbis teach the following, that every young adult as they grow are going to be drawn to the things of the world and to the better things of life. In other words, doing better than mom and dad did. And so what ends up happening, and the rabbis talk about this frequently to young adults, and it's true, that maybe you were raised in a home that was at a certain status, 
And then you go out into life or you go off into college and you begin to strive for better things. And then you become ashamed of your parents. You cease to honor them because they're not at the level that you wish they'd had brought you from. Does this make sense? And so what the Ten Commandments teaches and the conservative rabbis teach is that covetousness is the thing that destroys honor mom and dad. It's what brings the dissidence between that. And so think about that if you're in college. And just be forewarned because every college student goes through this. Mine did. How do I know? I talk to them about it. I talk to them about it. And so the final thought that I have is that one of my mentors challenged me to do this decades ago, and I've done it every single day. And that is, I end my day by kneeling by my bed. I don't say that at all to lift myself up at all. But every day, I kneel by my bed. I do not conclude a day without kneeling by my bed and bringing my concerns to God. Every single day. And it always begins with the Lord's Prayer. And then when I'm done praying the Lord's Prayer, I bring my cares and my concerns to God. Because the text says, if you do that, if you bring your anxieties to God in prayer, that God in Christ will position a sentinel, a guardian between head and heart. God's going to guard that 18-inch highway with stuff that's trying to pour in. And so I want to encourage you to do that. Men, None of us are smart enough or big enough to do life without this. We're just not. I also know that some of the cutest pictures you'll ever see is a little kid kneeling by their bed like this and praying. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you can't enter the kingdom. Maybe he means kneeling by your bed as a grown man or a grown woman and bringing your anxieties to the Lord. And then something that transcends all understanding just starts happening. It doesn't make sense mentally, but something starts to happen. And God begins to protect that that region that can be given to chaos between head and heart. Would you stand with me? As we stand together, we're going to have a moment of worship. And I know it's corny. Put your hand on your head, your hand on your heart as you close your eyes in prayer. Is there dissidence between head and heart? If there is, I encourage you to take this next time as we sing about the goodness of God, that you would take these next few minutes to pray and to bring that to God. Some of you might want to come forward to pray. At this point in our service, no one will be here to pray with you or to pray for you. Maybe you want to step out and just actually deal with this full sail and you know that you need to take a physical bodily move. That you need to move towards God and bring this to Him. Others of you can do the business where you're at. You can just simply deal with that thing, that anxiety that's been plaguing you. But can you take a moment as we sing about the goodness of God? You're getting tired. You can move your hand from your head. Well, let's take a moment to pray. Again, if you would like to come forward for prayer, you can. Let's worship. Let's worship.